Well, good afternoon, um, everyone. Delighted to welcome so many of you here to the second in our series of three um, webinars on uh, customs union trade and the trade and cooperation agreement. Now, who would have thought um, six months ago when Timothy and I were discussing this, that trade would be front and center of the political debate uh, yet again. Um, we've heard a large amount about the Northern Ireland Protocol um, and the Northern Ireland border. And of course, all of this requires unpicking and understanding of actually what uh, the TCA and in the case of the Northern Ireland Protocol the Withdrawal Agreement have to say. I've got a fantastic panel of speakers here. And um, because you want to hear them, not me, I'm not going to give them um, a lengthy and elaborate introduction. Can you just take it that there is a lengthy and elaborate introduction? And instead, I'm just going to say, we are very, very lucky to have so many really good people here. Um, I am going to give the floor first to Timothy Lyons, QC, who's going to talk about rules of origin. He will talk for about uh, just shy of 10 minutes. He will then be followed by Andrew Deakin, also of 39 Essex Chambers, who's going to talk on TBT and SPS, words that we didn't think would trip off our tongue so easily um, only a matter of two years ago. Uh, then Amelia Lanate, my lovely colleague from Cambridge, is going to talk about conformity assessment, also a really important topic and much uh, neglected. Before we turn to Anna Jurewska, who is a colleague I've got to know much more recently through um, our combined work on Brexit related issues. And she's the best person who absolutely can understand what's going on at the border and more importantly, talk about it in a way that mere mortals can understand. And then finally, Thomas Sampson, who's been doing the most magnificent work understanding the Brexit effect. Has Brexit affected UK trade? With that tantalizing question, um, I will leave you in suspension until the um, uh, end of the session. Uh, we will take uh, questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A box um, and I will try and get through as many of them as possible. And now I give the floor to Timothy and I am just going to um, upload um, his slides. Well, that seems fine, Catherine. Thank you very much. Can you see them? And if you just tell me when you want them move forward. Indeed, indeed. The floor is yours, Timothy. You've got just shy of 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And it's very good to be with you all. Uh, I want to make four points. First, I want to look at the background to these rules of origin that we now uh, have to deal with. Then I want to deal with some complexities in the rules of origin themselves. Uh, and thirdly, some uncertainty in the rules. Fourth, uh, let's have a look at what contracts can do in respect of rules of origin. So let's start then uh, with the next slide on the background. It's always helpful when you are looking at these rules um, to bear in mind what it was that the UK wanted when it started to negotiate. It didn't get what it wanted, and that's a significant uh, factor in, in understanding the rules. The, these rules of origin follow the standard uh, development of rules in trade agreements. They start off with goods that are uh, wholly produced in a country, in a party. Uh, then we look at what is sufficient working to uh, give you origin somewhere. And then we're told what is insufficient working. Now, if you have sufficient working, in a party, you get origin there. If you don't have that sufficient working, it's perfectly possible to get uh, origin if the rules permit it. So if a material is just used in the production of a good in a party, that mere use can give you origin. And obviously the broader the scope of that use clause, 
the easier it is to get origin in a party. When the UK started to negotiate, it said, look, we want to get EU, we want to get party origin for goods, even if they origin, re, originate in another country, apart from the EU and the UK, if they're in a what they call a relevant partner country, or a country that dealt with the a generalized a system of preferences. And you can see that that would have protected the UK uh, manufacturing chain because it would have been very easy to get origin in a party in those circumstances. We didn't get that uh, level of accumulation. Instead, we simply got stuck with a bilateral accumulation uh, clause, which uh, allows origin to be acquired um, only as between the parties and not through a wider range of parties. So when your clients say to you, gosh, these rules are narrow, yes, they are narrow and they're deliberately narrow. We knew that the rules we now have would cause us problems unless we uh, negotiated something different and we didn't manage it. So difficulties are bound to come in your manufacturing chain. So let's move on to the second slide. We can't, of course, go through all the difficulties, but I thought I would highlight to you one or two that have come to my notice in the course of some recent cases. Um, and you will see there on the slide, I've indicated that uh, preferential rules have to be viewed in the context of of the non-preferential rules, unless you get yourself in these preferential rules, you're, you're going to be in a non-preferential situation that will charge with more duty. Um, you have to deal with what I've called legal complexity and administrative complexity. Legal complexity, by that I, I mean, keep in mind that these rules have links with international law, UK domestic law, uh, customs law, and administrative law. And some of these links are not altogether um, obvious. You will find in some of the rules of origin reference to territorial waters, for example. And I had a case in which the territorial waters of the country were actually uh, assessed during the winter because uh, that was when there was a huge amount of sea ice and the country in question uh, wanted to um, define its land border and its territorial sea border by reference to the situation in winter because that gave it a much broader uh, um, sea uh, territorial sea so could it do that was it right um, international law is, is absolutely crucial. Administrative complexity, just a few weeks ago, I had a client who, poor, poor people, found themselves uh, in, on a merry-go-round consisting of the uh, Department of International Trade, the Foreign Office and HMRC. And all of them had told my uh, clients that the rules of origin had changed and they had better adapt. And they came to me and said, has the rules of origin changed? And I said, no, and don't adapt. What do you do practically when you're caught in this merry-go-round of administrative conflict? What we did, in fact, was to elevate our issue up the uh, chain of authority at HMRC, uh, but we also got involved uh, HMRC's lawyers, and uh, they actually uh, were able to uh, help us um, deal with what was, uh, at the end of the day, um, rather a large number of bureaucrats. Okay, so that's what I say about navigating complexity, coping with uncertainty. Well, you'd think that by now, drafting origin rules would be uh, 
be really easy to do. Um, in fact, it's very far from easy. And I've already referred to the idea that if you have sufficient production in a particular party, then you gain origin there. But there's also rules that tell you if you don't have sufficient production, you don't get origin. What is insufficient production? Well, you can read uh, all the relevant rules in what was Orange 7 and uh, has now acquired a number, but you'll find, for example, extensive use of the word simple. So simple painting, simple polishing, simple assembly won't give you origin. You've got to do something more in a country. What is simple? Well, I'd suggest to you that there is nothing quite so complex as discovering what is simple. Uh, when we talk about simple assembly, uh, I, I'm actually quite astonished that there is such a thing on the planet, because frankly, if you've ever seen me try to assemble IKEA furniture, you will know that I uh, certainly am unfamiliar with the notion of simple assembly. Apparently, our, our blessed customs officials are, are very familiar with it and able to tell us exactly what it is. Well, they have done their best, and you must, you must give them credit. They have produced some guidance to which you must refer. There are case studies for insufficient production, but you can also get advanced origin rulings. And it seems to me that that's something that you should bear in mind and go for. Um, if we move on to the next slide, uh, very briefly, um, uh, coping with uncertainty at four, I, I, have a, a reference to um, legal persons who have their main place of business in the in the EU or the UK. I wonder if I did, does that move, um, Catherine, to, to slide four? Yes, you, you'll see that. Um, the, the, this is taken from the rules of, of origin in respect of fish. Main place of business is what you've got to define. Well, what's that when it's at home? You can have a lot of discussion about what your main place of business is. Uh, again, um, I suggest there's quite a lot of uncertainty in these, in these rules, and it's as well to get um, uh, your advanced origin ruling if you can. And finally, before my head is cut off, let me tell you uh, by looking at slide five, um, that maybe your contracts can help the European Union is always saying that uh, traders ought to get their contracts in good order. Well, have a look at your supply of goods contracts to make sure that you've got the relevant terms in respect of both the nature of the good that you're buying and also the administrative processes that you might be required to enter into. Uh, because now it is the case that if you are dealing with the TCA and other member states, um, it may be that if you get things wrong in respect of origin, at some point in the future, you will be landed with a duty problem because you're not entitled, as it's subsequently discovered, to, to get preferential treatment. You get the ordinary treatment. And if that's the case, you end up paying more. This was a problem that existed for some traders before Brexit. It's now absolutely important to bear that in mind. We have introduced a problem into EU-UK trade that can be existential for traders. So beware of that and do what you can to get your contracts to protect you. And with that, I think I've come to the end of my 10 minutes uh, and we should move on uh, to Andrew, who's going to talk about um, uh, technical barriers to trade and other things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Timothy. That was really very helpful indeed. So Timothy's been talking about um, rules of origin for the purposes particularly of tariffs. And we're now going to talk about the bit, the area which Boris Johnson says is not a problem, which is uh, non-tariff barriers. So TBT and SPS. And Andrew, the floor is yours, 10 minutes for you. Thank you very much. Um, so hello, I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of the TCA's approach to sanitary and phytosanitary measures, technical barriers to trade, what they are, what the TCA says about them, and what role the WTO agreements play in all of this. Um, 
So onto the first slide. Um, as, as you know, uh, trade in goods is addressed in part two, title one of the TCA. And this section is broken down into a number of chapters. Um, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, SPS is dealt with in chapter three, technical barriers to trade or TBT in chapter four. So to start with some definitions. Um, TBT is very broadly defined in Article 89 TCA. The term applies to the preparation, adoption, application of all standards, technical regulations and conformity assessment procedures, which may affect trading goods between the parties. And SPS is carved out of that broad definition by Article 89 2B of the TCA. Um, by Article 512 of the TCA, SPS means any measure referred to in paragraph one of Annex A to the SPS agreement, helpfully, and again, that's a very broad definition when you get to it, and it includes any measure applied to protect animal or plant life from pests, diseases, disease-causing organisms, humans, animals from risks arising from additives, contaminants, toxins, or disease-causing organisms in food. Um, and just if that wasn't broad enough, measure itself has to be uh, read expansively and includes all laws, decrees, regulations, requirements, and procedures and that extends to testing, inspection, certification, and approval procedures, as well as packaging and labeling requirements directly related to food safety. And while we're on definitions, just to be clear, um, as you all know, I'm sure the SPS agreement is defined at, uh, in the TCA at Article 513H um, as the agreement on the application of sanitary and phytosanitary measures at Annex 1A to the WTO agreement and the TBT agreement is defined uh, just down in, in Article 513I of the TCA as the agreement on technical barriers to trade at Annex 1 to the WTO agreement. And then just to keep it simple, Annex 1, the Annex 1 definitions um, in the TBT ag agreement are incorporated into the TCA by Article 90 itself. Um, and these define technical regulation and standard, again, in the broadest terms, um, covering everything from processes to packing and labeling. So, why does this matter? Um, on, on the next slide, very briefly, there's a. Um, it, it's normal to think of free trade as being about tariffs, um, but it seems to me that regulation is just as important. Um, and the OECD Economics Department recently produced a useful analysis of the projected impact of non-tariff barriers, that's to say TBT and SPS on trade costs in various sectors. And just to draw attention to a few, um, the, the model shows a six, as you can see on that slide, a 6.9% increase above base in agriculture and food, 6.1% um, in textiles, wearing apparel and leather products, and an extraordinary 8.9% in relation to motor vehicles, parts and transport equipment. Now, these are just models, but their general significance seems to me clear. Non-tariff measures matter, so how are they dealt with in the TCA? Um, so on to the next slide, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Um, it seems to me the starting point is Article 19 of the TCA, which makes clear that each party shall accord national treatment uh, to the goods of the other party in accordance with Article 3 GATT. Article 3 is, of GATT is expressly incorporated into the TCA. And by Article 3 of GATT, of course, the parties recognize that various things, including laws and regulations affecting the sale of goods, again, very broadly defined, um, should not be applied to imported or domestic products so as to afford protection to domestic production. However, that, of course, needs to be read subject to the general exception provision, see Article 412 of the TCA, which also incorporates Article 20 of GATT. And Article 20 of GATT is the general exception provision of that instrument and provides that nothing in the GATT agreement should be read as preventing the adoption of measures necessary to achieve wide-ranging goals set out in Article 20, so long as the measures are not applied in a manner which would constitute a means of arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination between countries where the same conditions prevail or a disguised restriction on international trade. So the overarching framework seems to me fairly clear. The TCA leaves uh, national governments with very broad scope for regulating products subject to a prohibition on discrimination or disguised restrictions on international trade. And as we'll see, that logic runs through the specific provisions dealing with TBT and SBS. So starting with, with TBT, um, Section 88 defines the objective as of Chapter 4 as being to facilitate trade in goods between the parties by preventing, identifying, and eliminating unnecessary technical barriers to trade. Well, how far does that go? Article 90 of the TCA incorporates Articles 2 to 9 of the WTO TBT Agreement. And Article 2 of the WTO TBT Agreement concerns the preparation, adoption, and application of technical regulations by central government bodies. 
Well, these well-known provisions provide that parties are required to ensure that in respect of technical regulations, products imported from the territory of any party shall be accorded treatment no less favorable than that accorded to like products of national origin, We've seen that reflected before, to ensure that technical regulations are not adopted with a view to or with the effect of creating unnecessary obstacles to international trade, um, and to ensure that technical regulations are not maintained should the relevant circumstances which led to them being brought in materially change. Um, so you've also got the provisions at Article 91 and Article 92 of the TCA, which seek to limit the introduction of regulations and to encourage the use of relevant international standards. But the language in these articles is fairly light touch, and it seems to me that the controls are fairly easily avoided. So the short point is that these provisions of the TCA seem to me to afford states wide latitude to introduce their own regulations and standards, with that scope essentially only constrained by principles of non-discrimination and necessity. And that plainly leaves non-discrimination and necessity doing a lot of work. So as exporters must meet the technical requirements of each state to which they wish to export, it seems to be inevitable that frictions will develop. Now, it should be noted that the TCA is not simply reflective of the WTO TBT agreement. You've got annexes 11 to 15 of the TCA incorporated by Article 778, and these introduce a number of sector specific provisions in the TBT. You've got Annex 11 concerning motor vehicles, Annex 12 medicinal products, Annex 13 deals with chemicals, uh, Annex 14 organic products, and Annex 15 wine. Now, these annexes seek to limit the freedom of member states to diverge on standards in these areas, and note that some of the sectors um, highlighted are precisely where non tariff barriers create the most friction. But they're plainly not comprehensive, and it seems to me they do not alter the fundamental shape of how the TCA mirrors the WTO TBT agreements in addressing TBTs. What about SPS measures then? Well, these adopt a broadly similar framework to the TBT provisions. As we've seen, provision for SPS is carved out of the more general TBT provisions, and Article 70 of the TCA um, applies Chapter 3 to all SPS measures of a party that may directly or indirectly affect trade. Note that Chapter 3 also makes separate provision for animal welfare. Um, as with TBT generally, the objectives are ostensibly committed to minimizing barriers to trade, Article 89, and Article 6, oh, sorry, 69, I should say, and Article 69B um, has a commitment to further the implementation of the SPS agreement. Unsurprisingly then, Article 72 of the TCA reaffirms the party's rights and obligations under the SPS agreement. And this includes the right to adopt measures in accordance with Article 5.7 explicitly, expressly of the SPS agreement. What does the WTO SP agreement say? Well, Article 2 makes provision for members to uh, take measures necessary for the protection of human animals and plants insofar as it's consistent with the SPS agreement. It provides that SPS measures are to be applied only to the extent necessary to protect humans, animals, or plants, and to the extent they're based on scientific principles. And members are to ensure that SPS measures do not arbitrarily or unjustifiably discriminate between members where identical or similar conditions pre prevail and they shouldn't be introduced as disguised restrictions on trade. Article three pushes parties towards harmonizing SPS measures by relying on international standards, again, where they exist. But Article three, Article three, three I should say, uh, makes clear the parties may introduce SPS measures resulting in a higher level of protection than allowed for under relevant international standards where there's scientific justification. Article five is critical, especially Article five, two, when assessing risks, the party shall take into account, but no more than that, scientific evidence, relevant production methods, et cetera. Um, Article 5.4, parties shall take into account um, the requirement of minimizing negative trade effects, but note Article 5.7, in cases where relevant scientific evidence is insufficient, a member may provisionally adopt SPS measures on the basis of available information. So, as we have with TBT, it seems to me the SPS agreement effectively leaves states free to regulate as they see fit, taking into account international norms and minimizing negative trade effects. And the TCA doesn't go very much further than this at all. There's of course some pull within the SPS agreement towards greater harmonization, Article 4.1 and Article 4.2. Um, but the UK has no such additional agreements um, and it follows that UK exporters must meet EU SPS requirements. And indeed EU exporters are required to meet UK requirements when reporting or when exporting to the UK. There are some workarounds. The UK was granted uh, national listed status in December 2020, um, and this maintained the UK's export of, of live animals and animal products, a market worth about 5 billion annually, but 
that is not part of the TCA. And the UK itself has unilaterally limited import controls um, and has indeed ex extended the period for which it intends to operate such a reduced regime is a recent paper that came out on the 28th of April, um, where HMG made clear a number of control measures due to come into effect in July would not be introduced on that date. These relatively modest agreements are said to save the UK importers some 1 billion a year, that, that alone, and it makes clear how significant non-tariff trade barriers can be. So in con conclusion, um, it seems to me that the short point is the TCA simply doesn't make provision relating to TBT and SBS that takes the UK significantly beyond the baseline position as set out in the WTO, TBT and SBS agreements. Thank you very much indeed for that. That's an extraordinary whistle-stop tour around what is actually incredibly complex um, information. And um, I mean, I think the point you're making is very clear that actually um, what you have in the TCA really doesn't take you a whole lot further than the uh, WTO um, equivalent provisions. And I think Amelia, who I think is about to come online, um, is going to tell a rather similar story. Amelia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be in the second uh, seminar of this webinar series. Uh, so we have just heard from Andrew's excellent uh, presentation on technical barriers to trade, uh, why they matter, and the inevitable frictions that they uh, cause to trade. Um, so I would like to address one uh, uh, instrument, the aim of which is to uh, mitigate the effects of TBT. Uh, on interstate trade, and that is mutual recognition of conformity assessment. So mutual recognition um, is a form of international um, regulatory cooperation, and there mainly exist two uh, forms of mutual recognition. That is mutual recognition of professional qualifications, um, academic qualifications, and uh, mutual recognition of product safety. So otherwise known as a uh, mutual recognition of conformity assessment. Now the purpose of mutual recognition of conformity assessment is to facilitate um, trade by reducing the effects of technical barriers to trade, which arise due to divergences in the national technical regulations. Um, now uh, MRAs allow uh, a product such as a car, um, electric, Electro electronics, medicine, or whatever other, uh, which was produced and certified um, in state A to be exported to state B without having to undergo additional testing in state B. Now, states which have concluded an MRA agreement recognize the competence of a testing body in, in the exporting uh, country to perform conformity assessment uh, in accordance with the technical requirements of importing country. Um, so that is the MRAs uh, eliminate duplicate testing. Uh, so what I have described now is a, a traditional MRA of conformity assessment. So again, these testing laboratories in state A, export state are recognized and hence the word mutual recognition. Uh, they are recognized as competent uh, to issue certificates of compliance. And on the slide, you see those um, laboratories um, in the house symbol. Now, there is no harmonization um, of technical rules under such traditional MRAs. Um, each party maintains their own set of standards. In some limited cases, states may negotiate uh, what we call enhanced MRAs, and these are based on alignment of technical requirements. Uh, so we have uh, uh, one set of technical standards uh, that both states uh, importing and exporting apply. So an example of this, of course, would be the EU internal market based on the Casida de Jean mutual recognition principle. But there are also bilateral agreements. Um, the 2002 EU-Swiss MRA is the broadest enhanced MRA, uh, but there are also sectoral ones. An example would be 2004 EU-US MRA on marine equipment. 
And in both uh, of in traditional and enhanced MRAs, conformity assessment is conducted by um, designated bodies, conformity assessment bodies. But alternatively, states may also allow uh, what is called supplier declaration of conformity. And this is a written assurance by a supplier that his product uh, meets the requirements of the importing state. Um, these uh, are usually for low risk products. Now, MRA agreements may be concluded as part of a free trade agreement or as self-standing treaties, and according to the 2016 OECD data, there are currently 130 MRAs um, globally, and most of them were concluded in the past several decades. Now, in addition to state-to-state -state MRA agreements, member states, uh, states can, uh, can, can negotiate other forms of mutual recognition, such as voluntary multilateral recognition agreements. These are between the conformity assessment bodies themselves, uh, which are located in different uh, states. They can also be sector-specific intergovernmental arrangements. That's something that APEC countries have concluded. And then EU has a couple of uh, specific MRA arrangements. Uh, I can mention one, PECA protocol on uh, uh, to the European uh, agreements uh, on conformity assessment. And these are typically concluded by, uh, uh, between the EU and uh, candidate countries. And these are enhanced MRAs with regulatory alignment. Um, so the EU-Ukraine, for example, association agreement uh, provides for conclusion of PECA. Um, but while association agreements uh, that EU concludes with candidate countries typically have uh, provisions uh, for such enhanced MRAs, there are currently none actually being negotiated in, um, in practice. Um, the EU new generation free trade agreements uh, typically foresee a provision uh, that parties uh, would conclude um, uh, in the future a, a mutual um, recognition agreement. So for example, we find that in EU Korea, FDA, um, CETA, the, the EU Canada uh, free trade agreement stands out in this context because it contains uh, mutual recognition uh, uh, for conformity of conformity assessment um, for a number of products, um, electronics, telecommunications, toys, machinery. Um, it also contains good manufacturing practices for pharmaceuticals, and it also contains guidelines for negotiating uh, uh, mutual recognition of professional qualifications. Now, speaking about EU-UK relationship post-Brexit, UK did propose um, to include um, a mutual uh, recognition agreement on conformity assessment, this traditional type uh, of MRA, in the trade agreement, but this proposal was rejected by the EU. So instead, what we have in the TCA is something similar to what there is in CETA, but much Thinner. So there is no overarching MRA uh, of conformity assessment. Instead, there are some sector specific um, annexes which facilitate the approval uh, 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 and, and the regulatory compliance should be easier according to those sectors in a, in a several sectors such as chemicals, organic foods and wine. Um, and there is also um, uh, mutual recognition of certification in pharmaceuticals. So that would be um, uh, certification for good manufacturing practice for pharmaceuticals. Uh, and we find that in Annex 12 of the TCA, parties are obliged to recognize inspections carried out by the other party and accept official good manufacturing practice uh, documents uh, issued by the other party. Uh, another sector is automobile, Annex 11, uh, provides for recognition of motor vehicles, which are covered by UN type approval certificate. So this is an, a kind of enhanced uh, sectoral MRA based on international standards. Uh, TCA uh, also uh, provides for um, a possibility to negotiate uh, an MRA for professional qualifications. Uh, this is provided in Chapter 5 of Title 2, uh, Services and Investment. Article 158 provides that uh, invites professional bodies to develop joint recommendations uh, on recognition of professional qualifications to the Partnership Council. So, all in all, mutual recognition is very limited under the trade and cooperation agreement. All there is is basically um, 
TBT chapter that Andrew spoke about, um, but uh, very, very limited um, mutual recognition uh, obligations. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Amelia. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's always great to hear you talk about uh, mutual recognition. For those of you who have been teaching EU law for years, of course, you think fondly of Cassis de Dijon, um, the the, one of the few cases students ever remember. But of course, uh, mutual recognition is far more complicated than that, um, as you've just explained. Um, now I turn to Anna, um, who will talk to you about some of the practical operations. I can think of nobody better to talk on this subject than her. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I've been asked to talk about the practical challenges and problems at the border. And if you've been following the news, you'll know that there's a lot of different practical challenges and, and issues at the border. We have various different actors and various different processes taking place at the border. Borders are not obviously only customs formalities, but there's another, there's a, there's a whole set of, of procedures, processes and controls that take place at the border. For the purpose of this presentation, just because um, we have a limited amount of time, I thought, I, I thought I'd, I'd focus on challenges that traders uh, face. By the way, if you hear uh, some background noises, apologies, my neighbors picked this time to do something, uh, <laughs> imagine some sort of renovation or, or something, but it's very loud. Um, so I thought I'd focus on, on what challenges uh, traders are facing also because it kind of fits nicely with what uh, I believe Thomas will be talking about in a second. And I think if you look at the numbers and see the kind of the trade flows going up or down, as Thomas will explain, it's helpful to have the context and have an understanding of why companies might make certain decisions when it comes to importing or exporting. So I'll talk about three kind of general points, three challenges and three, I would say solutions, although they're not really solutions, kind of points around possible solutions. In terms of kind of three basic background points, um, the TCA is obviously an FTA and as an FTA, it has full customs controls plus rules of origin if you want to get that discount, if you want to get that preference. So from a customs, and again, purely, purely from the customs perspective, this is a very, a fairly standard FTA. It's, there's nothing unusual. It's, it's full customs controls and rules of origin. Um, but of course, uh, as, as we know, um, not necessarily all kind of controls work the same way on both sides of the border. This is something that, that's, that's an ongoing process. The second general point is that for a subset of UK companies, the processes, customs processes and border processes in general are new. The ones that have, not, that have only been trading, been trading with, with the EU previously. However, it's very important to kind of point that out just because it's not new doesn't mean it's not a, uh, not a challenge for companies. So if anything, you know, if anything, the TCA kind of undercovered this underlying issue of lack of compliance, uh, lack of um, sufficient knowledge and lack of ability to deal with customs formalities that a lot of companies, even a long-term, even long-term importers and exporters uh, perhaps you know, already faced before uh, the TCA. And the last uh, point is just to kind of caveat, um, you know, while we're talking about traders, obviously there's much more just as kind of a, a, a one side of the story, as it were, or one kind of slice of the, of the, of the bigger uh, problem. So while I'm talking about traders, that's obviously, you know, they, we've all been through the last six years. We know what the situation is and why traders have found themselves in that position. So it's by no means to say, means to say that traders are not doing something that they're supposed to or to, to kind of in any way um, blame them for, for the challenges that they're facing. Is just to say, you know, this is part of the process, this is part of the situation. So in terms of the challenges, I kind of, or the situation or the kind of um, difficulties to, at the border, I kind of, um, for the lack of better structure, I kind of divided it into three different points and they're all kind of interrelated and they all play off each other. So this is lack of compliance, lack of information and lack of engagement and bandwidth. 
and I'll take them in, in turn, but again, they're, they're very much related. Um, so lack of compliance, uh, as I mentioned, the, 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 the level of awareness or, or kind of knowledge or information that not all, but a lot of companies have when it comes to basics such as, you know, what commodity code do I need to use for my product and where do I find that commodity code? Rules of origin, which Timothy has mentioned, valuation, it always seems to be forgotten, uh, but also simple understanding, simple things like when uh, am I an importer? What do I need to do as an importer? Uh, does, does the fact that I have a customs broker, does the fact that, that uh, I outsource my customs uh, formalities to someone else, does that relieve me from, from legal liability? So these kind of questions very much are um, still relevant. And I think there's quite a lot of confusion still in the private sector. And that's something that, that is very much, um, it's been the case for a while, but I think the TCA with volumes kind of going back and forth highlighted this as an issue uh, especially with the speed that the changes uh, and, and the new new formalities have been introduced lack of information is is kind of a double edged sword because on one hand the guidance that's available does not necessarily cover all the basic companies when they look for information they look for very specific uh, pieces of information in some cases you know, the guidance that's out there perhaps doesn't cover the complex scenarios that we see in the, in the uh, private sector. In the same way, Timothy mentioned rules of origin. There's so many aspects, and I've also had a situation a couple months ago where we had a, a practical question that was not covered by the TCA or by the guidance on either of the sides. And there are so many practical aspects of how you would use rules of origin or other elements of other areas of customs that are not necessarily covered by the guidance or not covered to the extent that is uh, required. So if you do want to use uh, accumulation, not with, the, uh, not with the EU under the TCA, but for, for example, you want to use it with one of the uh, UK's other trading partners, what documents do you need? What, how, do you, how do you evidence that? What, how do you, um, if, if asked, what, what documents do you provide? Now, different, there are different ways of doing that under different trade agreements uh, around the world, but under the TCA, uh, sorry, under the UK's um, rollover agreement, for example, we're not always necessarily sure how to do that. So there, as, as Timothy pointed out, I'm just echoing Timothy's comments here. You know, there's some practical questions where companies uh, are struggling to find the answer. But there's also another part of that is that companies might not necessarily um, engage to the uh, engage with customs at, at the right level and this is the third point the lack of engagement and bundle with is that the fact that you know the entire system is under pressure there's been so many changes there have been so many demands on, on companies attention in the last couple of years if you're exporting to the eu it's obviously not just customs when when it comes to changes everything's changing and you need to pay attention to so many things there's so many changes on the domestic front you know you, there's there's not, I mean, customs is, is, is usually just a small part of the whole process, as much as uh, I would like to think otherwise. So uh, it's, it, you know, it, the, the lack of engagement, the kind of deadline fatigue, the changes fatigue, the fact that so many things are being announced and they're being postponed, companies not, do not necessarily find that process easy. In some cases, it's a, it's a, a you know, it's an announcement that welcomes, in some cases it's not, but the, it adds to this kind of constant state of, of changes, this constant, constant uh, requirement to follow, understand, uh, get some help and, and, and so on. So I think these, this, all, all these kind of three points lead to the situation where companies don't necessarily look at customs at this point as something that, that could be an opportunity. That could be a, a time or money saving opportunity. Customs is something that's a compliance burden, something that needs to be done, or perhaps doesn't even uh, doesn't need to be done, given that the last couple of years some companies have also mentioned that that you know that they've just given up on compliance altogether. But, com but customs and, and and engaging with the TCA doesn't necessarily you know when you when you mentioned the TCA opportunities to to uh, use that agreement um, and in, in order to use preference or, or kind of use various um, provisions of the TCA do not come to mind. What comes to mind is, is, is uh, customs compliance. Now, in terms of solutions and how, kind of, kind of how do we 
look at the TCA and look at the border processes and, and see what could be done, not perhaps in the short term, but in the longer term. The first thing that comes to mind is, is trade facilitation. And this is obviously the big topic in customs at the moment is how do we use common sense approach to streamline processes at the border. And this is something that if you go to a developing country, it's, it's the same challenge. How do we make these processes more efficient, simpler, business friendly, but at the same time, giving customs authorities and the government enough oversight and enough control and the ability to kind of enforce compliance. So how do we do that? And I think, you know, from that perspective, there is, I don't want to see a, I don't want to say an opportunity because that's perhaps uh, too much of a, of a, of a kind of um, uh, optimism here, but I would say we do have a rare um, chance to kind of review our processes in the UK with the border 2025 strategy and the fact that there is this, you know, that because everything's kind of up in the air and being reviewed, there is a chance to look at, at uh, customs processes and see what could be done uh, differently. And that's uh, something that not many countries usually get because border processes tend to happen in the same way for, for, for a long time. Now, unfortunately, whatever we're doing in the UK is on one side of the border only. This is not a joint cooperation. In the first version, the UK proposal before the TCA, in the UK draft proposal of the uh, future agreement, there was this provision around a joint pilot for, for the UK and the EU to kind of see whether we could have something or develop something similar to what Norway and, uh, and Sweden have around joint customs processes kind of you know, uh, joint import export one process instead of two. That didn't make it to the final version, unfortunately, and the way uh, things are going doesn't seem like this is in scope in the, you know, anytime in the, in the near future. But um, even on one side of the border, any changes would be welcomed. Digitalization, second um, point, uh, is obviously a buzzword at the moment. Um, I think it's important to remember that technology has a role to play once the systems and processes are streamlined. It can be an additional layer on top of streamlined systems to facilitate uh, trade, but it's not an answer in itself. And the last thing I'm going to say, the, the third point, is just to say that even in this kind of challenging, imperfect uh, world with, with the borders as they are, there's still quite a lot to do that, there's still quite a lot that companies can do if they are willing to kind of engage with customs and understand customs and, and, and look at it less as, as a compliance burden and more as something that they can help to shape with all these kind of strategies, uh, calls for evidence, ways for businesses to engage with the government on what's happening with customs and what the border processes are going to look like in the future. There is definitely still scope for companies to to shape um, or, or at least get their voices heard and and get their opinions out. I'll stop here. Thank you so much for that, um, Anna. As always, you managed to make uh, customs um, engaging and interesting and relevant and to people like us who don't do this on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, we've already heard that um, contrary to our Prime Minister's statement that there will be no extra um, uh, burdens at the border or indeed internally, this is not in fact what the TCA says um, or indeed does. And that brings me to our final speaker who um, will tell us, I hope, um, the effect of all of these changes on um, UK trade. Thomas, thank you so much for entering into the nest of vipers, which is known as lawyers, um, and talking to us. The floor is yours. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you for, for having me. Um, so I'm going to try and briefly summarise some work I've been doing with colleagues trying to understand how trade has actually responded uh, to Brexit and to the TCA more specifically. Um, as the uh, you know, preceding presentations have made very clear, the TCA has introduced a whole host of, uh, of non-tariff barriers. And I think it was Andrew who said, you know, non-tariff barriers uh, matter. Uh, you know, and I think that's a point on which lawyers and uh, economists are in broad agreement. Um, prior to the TCA coming into force, economists' expectation was that it might lead to a drop in UK EU trade by somewhere in the region of of 30%. Um, but, you know, one of the 
one of the positives, at least from a research point of view, that we get out of Brexit is it is going to provide us with this kind of rare opportunity to actually collect some evidence on how much non-tariff measures uh, matter. And that's what this, this, this work I'm going to talk about is, is starting to do. How have these non-tariff barriers affected UK trade so far? Uh, so here's a first look at kind of the raw data. Um, you can see here for exports on the left and imports on the right, how uh, trade has changed over the past decade. We've got the UK there in blue and the rest of the G7 are the orange dashed line. And if you focus on the kind of end of the sample, you know, what, what, what's very clear here is that, they, you know, there was a sharp drop in trade that we all know occurred because of COVID. And but then, you know, trade has actually bounced back fairly quickly uh, from COVID. But what we see with the gap arising there between the, the orange line and the blue line for both exports and imports is that the, the rebound in world trade that occurred in late 2020 and then in 2020, 20, 2021, the UK didn't fully participate in that rebound. And UK trade growth in, in 2021 was kind of disappointingly slow relative to the rest of the world and particularly to kind of other leading economies. So that immediately raises the question, you know, is that something particular about how the UK has been affected by and responded to COVID? Or this gap that we see emerging in 2021, is that the, uh, you know, the initial impact of the TCA on, on trade? So try and you know, tease out what's responsible for these changes. Um, we're going to compare, or, you know, what we have done is to compare changes in trade with the EU versus changes in trade with the rest of the world. The idea being there that at least to a rough approximation, we would expect that uh, COVID has affected you know, trade with the EU and trade with other countries to a similar degree, which is indeed what we saw happened when the pandemic first hit. There were very similar falls in EU and, and non-EU trade. Um, and then we're also going to, you know, exploit data on other countries' trade, particularly US and EU trade, to try and control for other factors that might affect changes in, in, in trade. So, you know, we're going to put, put, put this all together and we're going to try and tease out how has the TCA affected uh, UK trade. So to show you what you to show you what we find, I'm going to show you a series of charts summing up our results. Um, so kind of each of these charts you read in the same way. So let me just spend a little bit of time explaining how to read these charts. So the blue line on the chart indicates the change in trade with the EU relative to the rest of the world and relative to a baseline of quarter two 2016. So when the Brexit referendum occurred. So this is our estimate of how Brexit in the kind of post-referendum pre-TCA period and then the TCA itself have affected the uh, UK's trade with the EU. And this first chart I'm showing you is for, uh, for imports. Okay. So what you can see is that, you know, the, the estimates kind of jump up and down a little bit from quarter to quarter. There's volatility in short run trade um, data, but there's no obvious trend uh, in the period prior to the implementation of the TCA. But then, you know, what we see when the TCA comes into effect, which is the right hand side of the graph here, is we see a very sudden and, you know, at least so far, and we've got kind of one year of data so far, so far sustained drop in imports from the EU. Uh, and you know, the magnitude of this effect is around 25%. So, you know, we're finding that in the first year, the TCA reduced UK imports from the EU by on the order of, of 25%. Um, and for anyone that's kind of used to looking at trade data and seeing how much it kind of fluctuates from one year to the next, that is a very big sudden change that we would not typically expect to see in the data. So there's kind of clear telltale signs in the data of, of, of a big effect on the import side. Here's the same graph for exports. And what's interesting and surprising here is that we don't see the same drop for exports. Again, we're not seeing much action between the referendum and the TCA coming to effect. 
And there's some drop in experts in the first quarter of the TCA, but they then bounce back. So we're not find, finding evidence that the TCA has led to a drop in UK exports to the EU relative to the rest of the world, uh, which is a little surprising, particularly given that we know that uh, the UK has phased in import checks, whereas the EU introduced import checks immediately. So if anything, we might have expected to find bigger effects on the export side than the import side. That's not what the data seems to show. That said, what I don't want you to take away from this is that exports have been unaffected by the TCA. And to give kind of one example of why that is, let's talk instead about the value of trade, let's talk about the number of trade relationships between UK exporters and EU importers. Now, given the, the data we have available, the way we're going to define a trade relationship is whether we observe an a, a product, a very kind of detailed product. So we've got about 10,000 products in our data that we observe each of the countries they're trading with. And so we're going to count up how many of those products are traded with EU and non-EU countries in each quarter. And that gives us a measure of the number of trade relationships. So to give an example of a product in this data, it's umbrellas with a telescopic shark. So you know, reasonably de detailed data we've got here. And let's look at what happens to the number of trade relationships using the same approach as before. So we've got the effects for exports on the left and then imports on the right. And what you now see is a very sudden drop in the number of, 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 of relationships that coincides with the introduction of the TCA, both for exports and for imports, and particularly in this case for, for exports, where we're seeing a drop in the number of relationships by around uh, 30% under the TCA. Um, and when we dig into this a little bit more, that drop seems to be driven by the smaller value relationships exiting. Right? So with the, with the caveat that we don't yet have the firm level data to, to substantiate what I'm about to say, these patterns are very consistent with the changes in trade barriers introduced by the TCA, hitting smaller firms much harder than larger firms, and leading to a lot of smaller firms exiting from exporting uh, to the EU, while the larger firms that drive the values seem to have been able to better absorb the costs that the TCA has created, created and continue exporting. Um, so that's kind of the, that's the picture so far for what's happened to trade under the TCA. Just to finish, kind of you know, it's important to I think you know show a little humility when we're looking at this kind of data. This is only year one. Um, and we would expect trade to take maybe five to 10 years to fully adjust. And in addition, we're, you know, we will get more detailed data as time goes on to better understand these effects. But for now, the kind of headline takeaways are a big fall in inputs, uh, imports, less action on the export values, but clearly uh, smaller exporters seem to have been more affected, which has led to a collapse in the number of export relationships with the, with the EU. Um, so, yeah, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you in particular for explaining it without algebra for those of us who are not um, very good at algebra, but making your point so very clear. I did smile that we have a you you have discovered a Brexit opportunity, which is um, testing <laughs> testing a theory about non-tariff barriers in a real world um, scenario. Um, I'm conscious we're very close to six o'clock. Um, I'm also conscious there's one question um, in the Q&A box, which I think is for Timothy. I'll give Timothy a chance to address that in a moment, but Anna, I just wonder whether you want to say anything from your experience about how small firms are um, dealing with uh, TCA and all of the uh, new commitments that they have to uh, deal with. Is, that, is, this born, uh, is, is Thomas's research, is it borne out by what uh, you see? Manage to make it work. Uh, there's there's definitely an element of you know it's harder for smaller companies to hire someone to help them. That's definitely the case. However, I always kind of go back to the fact that there are really no rules. You see small companies that are very organized, very switched on. Uh, you know, someone sat down, read through all the guidance, uh, figured it out, and and they're trying to engage. They might not be getting it right the first time, but they're trying to engage. And then you see multinationals that have been importing and exporting for, for 
decades and, and are still relying on their customs broker. So I would say there are, there are no rules. There's obviously, you know, there, there's obviously a much bigger kind of learning curve for smaller companies, especially smaller companies that have not exported and imported before. But some are doing pretty well, actually. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, um, Anna. Um, Timothy, do you want to put your camera on and just uh, answer the question which is in the Q&A box? It's a question that says, what potential benefits are there in the UK joining the PEM convention to solve the lack of diagonal accumulation rules in the TCA? It's a shame Sam Lowe's not here because that's his favourite subject on the sun, or at least that's what he claims anyway. Well, yes, uh, and indeed Sam has, 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 has written quite a lot on it. I mean, we're, we're asked what the potential benefits are. Um, I mean, I suppose one should just say that the pan euro mid uh, convention uh, is a way of replacing a series of bilateral agreements in respect of origin with a single convention which gives you the same rules in respect of. I think it's now 23 parties, uh, and one of those parties is the EU. Um, so um, one is EFTA, so you end up with at least, I think, 60 countries at stake uh, in this. So um, to the extent that you simplify everything in respect of 60 countries, yes, that's a benefit. The other benefit that you get is that there is diagonal accumulation within the Euromed area. So that you will, uh, I mean, I started off talking about the sort of accumulation we wanted. We didn't get it. We got bilateral accumulation. We would get diagonal accumulation in, if we were in the in the um, uh, Euromed area. Uh, uh, and um, obviously, the Euromed uh, Convention um, quite strongly supported by France and by Macron, uh, largely because he sees this sort of uh, possibility of creating this uh, way beyond. Mediterranean uh, sphere of influence now, um, whether it's really practical politics to, 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 to do that now uh, is, is questionable. It was certainly when, when Sam was write, writing about this in 2017, it, was, it looked perfectly sensible. Um, now it's still sensible, but uh, um, well, I, <laughs> we're in a world in which nothing is sensible. So I, I uh, uh, but the question is, are there benefits? Yes, diagonal accumulation, um, simplification, and certain other um, uh, simplifications within, within the structure of the, of, of the protocol, certainly. Thank you very much indeed for that, Timothy. Um, uh, I've just checked whether Andrew or Amelia want to add anything to that. This, this is your last opportunity in the audience to put questions. Um, but if I'm not seeing any coming in, um, may I take this opportunity to remind you of our third and final um, session in this series? I don't know, can you, can you see the slide there or has that not come up? It has come no, up. I can see it perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just to remind you that this time next week, you will have the opportu your opportunity to put your questions and your thoughts to um, the man who might be able to do something about all of this, which is uh, Julian Braithwaite, um, Director General for Europe at the Foreign Commonwealth Office, um, and Adam Marshall, who um, has had a lot of uh, hands-on experience in managing all of this. So please uh, get your um, pens ready to pose your questions to them. Um, I would like to close by giving a huge thanks to our speakers for tackling what for some is techie, but for others is of course existential, um, as we've already heard. Um, I'd also like to thank the good people at 39X Essex Chambers for doing um, all of the technical work and to UK and a changing Europe for um, doing a lot of the comms work in the background. Um, good luck to you all for having to uh, manage all of this as if this is your day-to-day -day job and otherwise may I wish you a very good evening. Thank you and good night.